sunshine into a rainy day. I love to worship with you guys. It just lifts my spirit, and um, I'm encouraged that the, all this water coming down on our campus is going out away from the building. Hallelujah. New drainage systems are in place and working well. I'm still just praying for that roof to cover everything well. I hope you're enjoying that artist rendering out in the lobby. Um, I appreciate you guys praying and encouraging about the new roof that's to come soon. Um, we got the marriage conference coming up this weekend. It begins Friday evening and Saturday. It is free. We just want you to register. There's well over, uh, what, a couple of hundred people coming. This is an awesome event. This is going to be so great to be with you in a marriage conference, whether you're thinking about getting married, whether you're married, whether stage of life you're in, in your marriage. Uh, Rebecca and I are leading a breakout session for empty nesters. But that doesn't mean you have to have had children to come to that breakout session. If you're in that age group, we would welcome you because we think we have a word for you. There's a breakout session that Herman and Amy Cherboni, our, our family ministry pastors, are leading. Uh, Clint and Hannah Minikoff are leading another breakout session. It's going to be awesome, and I just encourage you to register online. Go to our website and do that so we know that you're coming. It's going to be great. Right? It's going to be great. I know a lot of you are excited to come. You are. i got to have a family moment with you. Is that okay if we have a family moment? All right, family meeting. My children always dreaded hearing that when it was time to eat dinner. And I said, y'all, come on. It's time for a family meeting. Oh, we just want to eat. Dad's got something to tell us. Where's Logan Green? There you are, sir. You, you, I, I was looking where you usually sit, and you had already shifted over. Come on up, sir. My friend Logan Green, let's give him a round of applause. It's good to see you up here with a microphone for a change rather than controlling our microphones. Uh, family moment, life happens, changes happen. This guy is in store for a change. He's been a big part of New Covenant Church since 2010. He's seen it all. He's seen four worship pastors come and go. Well, the fourth one's still here. Yes. Well, you've seen three come and go. <laughs> four is here. Yes. Four is here. <laughs> he's seen leadership changes. He's seen technology changes. This man has helped lead us through COVID. This man does our information technology. He does our audio, our video. He's, cre he's produced so many video projects that have ministered the gospel well beyond our walls. We couldn't have survived COVID without you, sir. You made it possible for us to, I love the word pivot, don't you? Pivot, we use that so much in 2020. You made it possible for this church to pivot from being so much about being in the room to making us available worldwide. And um, I just uh, appreciate all the, the gifts that God has given you the experience that God has given you, the, the, the lifelong learning that's within you. But Logan's got a change coming, and at the end of this month, he will no longer be on staff with us, but he's still going to be a part of the body of New Covenant Church. He's not moving out of town or anything. He's not leaving the church body, but he will be taking a different job, and he's pursuing that and, and going where the Lord leads. And, and I'm excited to watch your journey, sir, as most of this family is this is your spiritual family and some of them is your this is your blood family and uh, we've watched you grow up we've watched you grow up in many ways and uh, I just want to say not only have you been amazing as a staff person but you've been amazing as a minister you've been amazing as a, a friend you've been amazing as just a man of God and we had some you and I have had just some times together like 10 hours in a car going to Michigan and so I kind of got to know you, and you got to know me, and I honor you, sir. You've honored me, and I love you, and I want you just to take a few minutes to share, and um, that's a microphone, there's a button right here, and you would turn it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah this, is, this is my church. Um, it, it's bittersweet, and, um, and it's 100% guided by God. Um, about a month and a half ago, um, that's when God told me it was time for a transition. And 
marinated on, on it for a little bit, and I made the decision to uh, step down. Uh, but uh, I, I have to honor Pastor Blake and Pastor Jenny, y'all, these great leaders. Um, Both of these people have absolutely poured into my life. This church has poured into my life. And um, just like Pastor Blake said, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm August, in October 1st, I'm planning to be in the congregation just like everyone else. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to enjoying uh, congregation life <laughs> rather than being uh, behind a soundboard uh, or, or uh, controlling a team of some, some sort. And um, also, I just want to say, I, we have an amazing tech team. I love them. Um, they have supported me, and boy, they they've they've taken some curveballs just like I have. They've uh, and steep learning curves, y'all. <laughs> steep learning curves when we get new technology and things like that. So, love them to death. Love the love you guys, and um, thank you for everything that you've given me and uh, the opportunity that I've had here. Just stay standing while we pray for this man. You can extend a, a hand if you like, just as a show of unity. Father, you see changes in our lives all the time. You see them coming. You see them going. You see where they're going. One thing we can count on, Lord, in this life is change. And Lord, yet you stay with us. You are steadfast. And God, I ask that you would honor this man who has been faithful, who has stayed steadfast. He has served you well. He has served this church well. He continues to serve this church well. I don't expect his service to end in one capacity. It just ends as, a, as an employee, and it, it continues. And maybe, Lord, this is a time that you're freeing him up and setting him up and raising him up and and setting him into a new position of higher influence, greater influence that will take all the things that he's learned here, God, and you would put it on full display for your kingdom, God, and let, let him be a blessing to, to this entire community with his gifts, skills, and talents, and his heart, God, I pray that you'd provide for him, you would give him a pathway that he could go down, God, I pray that you would put up guardrails so he wouldn't go to the left or the right, that he would just follow you, God, and he would just walk into your loving arms for the next chapter in his life, God. I, I know that he trusts you, God, and I'm just proclaiming that this is a, this is a God-trusting man before you, and, and you will see a testimony unfold that will bless you, church family, and God, I know it will bless you. As, this is a humble man also, God, and, and in that there is strength in his humility, God. Use this mighty man of God. Use him, Lord. And may he be blessed as he goes. And may he be blessed as he continues to be a part of this family. And may he be blessed as he continues to be a minister of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Logan. Today I want to talk to you about mistakes and about how we respond to mistakes and how we can respond to mistakes well. Because you've made a few. I've made a few. And in the mistakes is where character is built, where lessons are learned, where we mature, where we grow. It's important as Christians that we respond well to others' mistakes and our own mistakes. 
And if you're in a growth group, you've been navigating the Gospels, and we're sticking in the, with the Gospels, and, and soon next week, I think you'll be studying on parables, and so I thought today, I'm going to use three parables to, to communicate what the Lord has put on my heart. One parable I've heard before, one parable of Jesus, and one parable that I wrote. And I want you to, to listen for where you fall in these stories, because a, a parable is powerful. A parable teaches a a moral lesson. Sometimes if it's a biblical parable, if it's one that Jesus tells, a parable communicates a spiritual truth. Some would say it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so my first parable begins with a young man and his wife in church, and his cell phone goes off, and the pastor scolds him in the service, and the people around him are obviously ticked off at him. And on the way home from church that afternoon, his wife berates him in the car. How could you be so careless? And you could see the shame and humility and embarrassment on this young man's face. Later that evening, he goes to the bar, visibly shaking by the events of the morning. And he orders his drink and he spills it accidentally. And the, the, the waiter comes with a, a, another set of napkins to help clean him up. And the, the custodian comes out and mops up the mess. And the, the manager comes out and offers a complimentary drink. How about a latte? Did you think this was an alcohol bar? I, I say coffee bar, right? How about a free latte on the house? And then the manager gives this man a a hug and says, you know, it's okay. We all make mistakes. Well, that man never came back to that church, but he kept going to that bar and continues to go to that bar. You see, in the mistake was a tender, vulnerable moment that's life-changing. And you can be corrected and hurt Or you can be taken care of and loved. You see, these mistake situations happen all the time. We make them. We inflict them. We are the victims of them. And where our heart is in the moment can make or change the deal. It can change somebody's life. And so for us to handle mistakes well... It's so important. The the lesson in that parable is what? Let me see that on the screen. I got that lesson. The lesson learned is you can make a difference by how you treat people, especially when they make mistakes. That's the lesson of that parable. And the lesson is meant for the pastor, the people sitting around that young man, the spouse. You can make a difference in their life by how you treat them when they make a mistake. The lesson wasn't for the young man. It was for the influencers in his life. And we're all influencing people all the time. So be careful how you handle someone's mistake. My second parable is in the book of Luke chapter 18. It's one that Jesus tells it's the Pharisee and the tax collector many of you are familiar with this parable in Luke chapter 18 verse 9 Jesus he also Jesus told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt two men went up into the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. 
What's the lesson from that parable? Be humble. Don't compare yourself to others. Hmm. On the surface, sure, that's maybe the basic lesson of that parable. But we can go so much deeper. It's such a lesson about prayer. It's such a, a lesson about humility. It's a, it's a lesson about even theology. It's so much about God and his acceptance of you, which is based on love, not works. And so this Pharisee had so much to, to share with God. I do all these things. I, I, am, I am this and I am that and I follow these rules. But he didn't ask for anything. And yet the tax collector, the, the publican, as he might have been called back in that day, said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. He asked for mercy because he knew he was in sin and he knew he was in a disconnect with God. He said, God, have mercy on me. And Jesus, as he tells this parable, which is a, a story, not a historical narrative, this is a story to convey a truth, says it's the tax collector that was set free. It was the tax collector who was declared righteous and just. Because there was a, a will. God says basically to the Pharisee, you can do all these things, but you're still guilty. And tax collector, you don't have to do anything. Just asking for mercy and love in my grace, you're found innocent. And so there's that, that theology that we can learn in that parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And there's these cycles that sometimes we go through as our culture tells us to do more, work more, look at me, humble brag. Oh, man, how many times do I see that on social media? It's such an honor to be honored. Just want you to see it. In case you didn't see it, it's such an honor to be honored. Well, why don't you let that organization that honored you honor you? Why don't you sit at the end of the table and be called up to the front? You know, in these humble brags, it's just out of a desire for love. That's all it is. We just want to be loved. We want to be celebrated. And in case you didn't celebrate me, let me help you celebrate me. We've all been there. We've all done it. Thanks, social media. You kind of just suck us into that. Don't do it. There's much less honor. You lose honor when you do that. And so taking the humble road, taking the humble path, and saying, God, I, I, I'm just grateful for your mercy and your grace and your love. Rather than the Pharisee saying, I'm doing good works, I'm praying, I'm tithing, I'm coming to church all the time. Those are good things. God did not condemn the Pharisee for doing good things. He didn't condemn the Pharisee for righteousness. He condemned him for self-righteousness. That's what we got to be careful of. And he commended the tax collector, not for sinning, but being a repentant sinner. Taking the humble road, the humility in that is what's beautiful. And in this lesson, in this, this parable, we, we understand this lesson that I told you about humility and pride. But really, if we look a little deeper, they're both looking for love. Have you ever thought about the Pharisee is really looking for love? And he's trying to find it in the approval of men. Because his prayer was heard aloud, especially to the tax collector. And we do this. We do this. We, we try to achieve and, and take a higher place for approval. And yet, we're really doing that maybe to please people. And we may think that God will love us for it. God doesn't love us for the things we do. God loves us because we love him. And we give our lives to him through Jesus. There's this, there's this next parable that I want to share with you that I, I just made up. But I think it gets to the point I want to share with you today. Two men go into a bar. 
a coffee bar, okay? Two guys go into a bar. Every story's got to start like that. One is seeking God. And one is a Christian. And they're sitting down, having a drink. And the non-Christian looks over at the other guy. He kind of knows him but doesn't know him. And he says, hey, why do you go to church? And the Christian says, well, that's where, that's where people go that follow Jesus. This is where I find my spiritual family. It's where I find community. It's where we learn to follow Jesus together. And we serve together. And we worship together. It's where followers of Jesus gather. And the unbeliever looks at him and goes, hmm, well, who is this Jesus, this follow? Why, why do you follow this Jesus? And the, and the Christian says, well, he loved me and he, he gave his life for me. And the Bible says the, the, way, the wages of, of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through his son Jesus. He loved me to the cross. And changed my life forever. He loves me so much. And then the unbeliever says, hmm. Well, then why does a loving God send people to hell? And the Christian looked at him and loved him. And the other guy found God. Now you may think, Wait, what kind, of, what kind of answer is that? What did he say? How did he answer the question? But, but my point to you is that in a parable, it's a story to try to teach a spiritual lesson. And a spiritual lesson requires a spiritual response. And you can reason and debate and use logic all day long to try to, try to logic someone into your Savior. Do you know anybody that finally just said out of an argument, I give up, I'm through debate, and I'm going to follow this Jesus? <sighs> You're wearing me out, Christians. Never. I haven't. Maybe you have. But eventually there's some moment where the Holy Spirit is free to work in a moment of humility and searching God. This guy's asking all the right questions. Why do you go to church? Why do you follow Jesus? Well, I, I've heard that there's a heaven and a hell. Why would God send people to hell? Well, if you're going to get caught up on what's the response to that answer, then just know that there's not going to be any change of heart. There's not going to be a spiritual transaction in that. There's just going to be a longer argument or debate. But while I'm here, I'll answer the question. I saw you leaning in. Why, why would? You need to be able to answer this, Christian. Why would a loving God send people to hell? First of all, the question's wrong. God doesn't send anybody anywhere. Because He loves us, He gives us the freedom to choose. We're not forced to love anyone, much less God. He gives us the freedom. That's how much He loves us. And we kind of get caught up. When I say the word hell, I even don't, I don't even feel good saying it. It feels icky even talking about it. Preacher, why are you talking about hell today? I really didn't come here for that. I want to be lifted up. But Jesus talked about hell all the time. And I haven't preached about it in a long time. But Jesus described it as Gehenna. You know what Gehenna is? That's, a, that's an ever-burning trash heap, a landfill, a dump where things go to die. And it's smoldering all the time. But don't, don't get caught up in what heaven is and hell is. That's, that's the problem. Because heaven isn't floating around on clouds. And hell isn't standing there in torture while you burn forever. The Bible never says that God sends us to be tortured but God is in one place and God is not in another and in the place where he's not where God is not good is not and therefore things are are dark 
and dead. And the Bible does say that there's torment there, not torture. But the torment is because you're not with God. And it's too late to do anything about it. That's torment. Have you been in love with somebody and they didn't love you back? You know that torment, sick feeling in your stomach? That's just earthly torment. Think about the forever torment of your soul. When you're a place like Gehenna, which was a, which was a literal landfill outside the walls of Jerusalem that just smoldered all the time. And Jesus felt that was, that's a fitting description for you to get a taste of what that might be like. But heaven is where, where the Lord dwells and there's light and goodness and joy forever. That's where he is. And where he's not, none of that exists. And so because he loves you so much and he gives you the freedom to choose, he makes a way that you can be in heaven with him. You see, why don't, why don't we get this Lesson, why don't we get this spiritual lesson that he's not sending anybody to hell. He's loving everybody to him. We got it in our lyrics of our songs all the time. We're singing about if you love someone, you got to let them go. Who's my Sting fans? Anybody love the police? 1985, free, free, set them free. Right? If you love somebody, you got to let them go. Ladies, how many times have you ever had a man pursue you that you just really didn't want to date? Any, any female in the house? I know there's more than one. Men, how many times have you fell, fallen in love with someone, with a lady, and the lady says, I like you, but just as friends? Oof. You know, that, that's the worst, right? It's, it's like tormenting inside when you get that response but if you get that response men what would it be like if you just refused to accept that answer and you're like I don't care I'm going to force them to love me I'm going to take them home with me until they finally just say I love you I'm going to harass them I'm going to stalk her now what kind of love is that that's no love at all that is possession. Does someone say obsession? It's obsession that leads to just wanting to possess somebody. And our Lord doesn't want to do that. He wants you to love him freely. So many songs. I know Taylor Swift's got some. I know Sting's got some. I know Selena Gomez, Coldplay. They've all got these songs about this thing that we love and we're moved by in these lyrics. And yet when it comes to God, that's not acceptable. Because you're dwelling on the place. I think you're thinking of that. How could a loving God allow us to choose? And if we don't choose him, then it's such a terrible fate. It's just because he's not there. How could you refuse that love? How could you refuse the love of where he's at and how he offers it to you? Romans 1.28 says this. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. Oh, that hurts. But God woos us. God pursues us. God sends us messages all the time through his written word, through testimonies of changed lives, through miracles. Throughout 2,000 years of Jesus changed saints. And yet, eventually, he lets you go. You're free. Because he loves you that much. He's not going to put you in bondage. He's going to either set you free from the bondage of not knowing him, or he's going to set you free to just follow yourself rather than follow him. This is a great love letter in the scriptures. Every gospel is just love letters coming at you. Like, follow me. Humble yourselves. I made a way. I don't send anybody away, the Lord says. 
but he does set people free. And there's a time that runs out. We don't have all eternity to make the choice. What I want you to do as we come to these mistakes in maybe theology and wrong thinking about, about God sending people to hell, that's wrong thinking, wrong question. We can make theological mistakes. We can just make life mistakes. We can hurt people with our words and with our actions. But in the mistakes are the tender, teachable moments. And that's where we can either love someone like this man did in this bar. He looked at this person and said, okay, you've asked me about why I go to church. You've asked me about why I follow Jesus. And now you're trying to throw me with trying to test the character of God. And I, I could sit here and talk for an hour about the theology of, of the righteous judge and how just God is. And then about his mercy and grace. But, but the heart of it is, in every mistake is a chance to respond with, rules and rigidity or love and relationship and by the time this these two guys kind of knew each other but then this conversation went deep real fast and the guy saw a chance to either I can just roll out some lesson I've learned in Bible school and I can still do that and I'm not going to leave him hanging but I'm going to probably say oh friend you're really searching for God aren't you and let me tell you how he changed my life. You see, God loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus to live on this earth and live perfect, sinless life and show us how to live. And then he went to the cross and died for my mistakes. He responded to my mistakes with a perfect sacrifice that forgives all my mistakes forever past, present, and future. That's how much he loved me, that he would die for me. But he rose again, and he intercedes for me. He's changed my life. The Holy Spirit has come into me and is transforming me. And the Holy Spirit has come upon me and given me power and revelation and gifts. And I'm a new creation. And I would love for you to fall in love with my Jesus. Hang out with me. Come to church with me. See these other people. That have been changed by following Jesus and giving their lives to Jesus and now doing life, making mistakes, but hopefully learning from them and being loved through them rather than corrected and judged through them. A friend of mine that's not in here today. For a little while, his cell phone kept going off in service. And I love this man. And I knew his heart wasn't to be disruptive. I'm like, this is a tender moment. It's like right in the middle of prayer or right in the middle of the response. Dun, 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 dun. You're breaking the, the, the moment. Like you're, you're grieving the spirit when your phone's going off, man didn't say anything in front of everybody but after like the third time just like friend <laughs> do you know how to silence your phone <laughs> and he did not he did not know how and so he was shown how to silence his phone and he knew that I loved him and we had relationship already which was that was helpful but why is it when people in spiritual authority give correction, it's taken so heavy and then it becomes a church wound and then people leave? Well, I've got deeper love for you than most people in your circle. And if I have something to share with you that helps you, that you may be mistaken in, no, my heart is because I love you. And just like this friend that I said, hey, can you silence your phone? Oh, I don't know how. Well, let me show you how. And and, and I don't know if you even realized it. Maybe your, your hearing aid wasn't picking that up. But it was going off and distracting people that were like maybe making a decision to follow Jesus. Or to ask for forgiveness. Or to forgive somebody in the room. And then we're like, squirrel. 
And th that happens to all of us. And so this, this man, this gentleman, he could have said, I'm, I, I appreciate you telling me how to fix my phone, but I'm embarrassed and humiliated and, and I'm ashamed and I'm never coming back here again. But he wasn't immature. This man's way my senior. He's been here way longer than I have. The next day, he came to volunteer at the church. He said, Pastor, thank you. I don't want anybody to be disrupted from what the Holy Spirit is doing in a moment. Far be it from me to be the one that causes it. Thank you, Pastor. I'm, a, I'm correctable, and I'm a lifelong learner. Oh, man, that blessed my soul. That blessed my soul. And I'm not discounting church hurts and church correction that's done poorly and heartlessly and just about the rules and religion and not about the relationship and the family and the love. If you've been around for a while, you know me better than that. It's rare that there's an opportunity for such a conversation. But if there is one, I'm open. I love to learn. And I've learned so much from some of you showing me the way. And if I can show anybody the way to Jesus and along that way, it has to do with being teachable, being learning, learning, a learner, a lifelong learner. Get these preconceived religious notions out of your head and understand the love and relationship in Jesus. I don't know the conversation of this with these two guys in the bar because I made up the story. But I'm you can fill in the blanks. It can go well or it can go to hell. I didn't write that down. I didn't. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, these moments are that important. They're that important. And I don't mind sharing about these heavy, hard things. I want you to be, I want you to be equipped to answer well. Because the scripture says in 1 Peter 3.15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Oh, why is the church not known for that? Gentleness and respect, honoring one another, even in the mistakes. Those can go bad, those can go poorly. Or those can be part of your testimony. They can be part of the story of you and your faith in Jesus and your church. That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? Last scripture. 1 John 4, 14 through 16. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. Can we stand? and celebrate the love of God that although there is a harsh reality of being separated from God that we don't want to be a part of but it's not about what the place is like it's about the absence of a loving God and God makes a way through Jesus his son if we would just surrender our own plans to his plans and say yes Jesus, I receive your love. I believe that you loved me. And it's in the relationship, not the rules, that our story is made right forever. Forever. You can, you can tell that story. You can be a part of that story. For altar ministers, if our prayer teams would come up, this is an opportunity for us to maybe pray for forgiveness if we've corrected somebody wrongly maybe it's a maybe it's a time to ask for prayers where you feel like 
the church or somebody in spiritual authority has corrected you wrongly. And I ask for forgiveness on behalf of the church if that's occurred to you. Because the heart of the Father is for you not to be hurt and walk away. The heart of the Father is for you to know that in the mistake there's grace, in the mistake there's love, in the mistake there's mercy. Come to Him where the love is. Father, I thank you that you have given us your son Jesus as, as a, the ultimate expression of love. You long for us to come to you. You long for us not to be separated from you for eternity. God, I pray that us as Christ followers, that, that we can answer these kinds of questions. And, and I thank you, God, that, that you give us your, your word so we might understand and study. But I'm, I'm just as grateful, God, for the heart of the matter, for the, for the things that only Holy Spirit could, could do and draw in and change. God, I pray that, that we make room for Holy Spirit that, that we are in a humble posture when mistakes happen. And we realize that if it weren't for you, our mistake could keep us separated from you. God, it's a privilege to minister in the mistake. May this be a church that's known for ministering in the mistakes. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you come for prayer? The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light.